Hey guys, alright? Welcome everyone. In December of 2022, Dan Foster is on the phone trying to secure a job. He lists his military background as a member of the United States Army Special Forces, Green Beret, and his current job as a biology teacher, hoping to get hired. When he returns home, where a Christmas party is taking place, he asks his daughter named Maury for help with carrying some things. His wife, Emmy, asks him to help with the party preparations, but Dan says he's on the phone and will most likely get his dream job in a laboratory. Emmy mentions that Maury received a letter from Dan's father, which he immediately throws in the trash and tells his wife that he has lost the right to be a grandfather. He goes outside to finish the call, where he learns that someone else got the job, leaving him extremely upset. He returns inside the house and sits down to watch the World Cup on TV with his daughter. Dan then tells her that the players on TV are the best in the world, and she says she wants to be the best. He tells her that to become the best, you have to do what no one else wants to do. Suddenly, to everyone's shock, a strange portal appears out of nowhere on the football field, and several soldiers emerge from it. They explain that they are from the year 2051, a time when a global war is raging against an alien race called the White Claws, who invaded Earth and nearly destroyed all life. The woman who speaks asks for help in the war. Several months later, the world starts sending military forces to the future to assist, but only a quarter of all the people who went managed to return. Due to the significant losses and resource scarcity that ensues, nations decide to start sending civilians as troops as well. But even fewer of them return, and people begin to question if it's worth it. One day, Dan is giving a biology class when he realizes that no one is paying attention and, instead, asks what inspires them. Only one student, named Martin, raises his hand, he wants to talk about volcanoes, which excite him. The other students don't understand why they need to study, as life will end anyway. Dan tells them that it will happen almost 30 years in the future, and what the world needs now more than ever are scientists. Suddenly, he receives a message on his phone asking him to confirm his enlistment status. He goes to the nearest military processing station, where they inform him that he will die in seven years, which makes him eligible for recruitment. He asks them to explain what is happening, but they are enigmatic and don't listen to him, placing a device on his arm. He is informed that the device will track him and assist him in the future war, and it cannot be removed until he returns from 2051. When he later tells Emmy what happened, she is disturbed and tells him that they will run away from the government. Dan says he doesn't know how to escape, but Emmy insists that he knows someone who does. A few hours later, Dan meets a man in an aircraft hangar, and they engage in a sarcastic conversation. The man, named James, is about to start removing the device from Dan's arm when Dan tells him it's strange that he came since he never wanted his help before. Dan becomes furious, saying that all he ever wanted was a little help, but he never received it. Angry, Dan leaves, instructing him never to send letters to Murray again, revealing that James is Dan's father. When he returns home, Emmy sees that the device is still on his arm and becomes sad. She tells him that he needs to inform Murray so that she also knows. Dan goes to the backyard, where Murray is digging, and as he explains to her that he is going on a trip, she immediately understands that he has been recruited and becomes sad. He promises her that he will return and hugs her before leaving them. Before jumping into the future, the group of people being sent with Dan is introduced and trained in weaponry with first aid training to increase their chances of survival. Receiving instructions from soldiers from the future, Dan meets Charlie, a scientist who talks a lot when he's nervous, like now. A guy named Dorian, who is after them, tells Charlie to be quiet. Later, Charlie explains to Dan that this is the third time Dorian has been to 2051, which surprises Dan as he always hears that no one comes back. As they continue talking, they realize that everyone in 2051 is very young, and all the people being sent to the war are over 40. They conclude that this must be to avoid some kind of temporal paradox. They are later informed that the White Claws, the aliens they are fighting, disappear every six days to rest, which the young soldiers from the future call Saturday. This is when they send new troops to the future and also bring them back. This means that everyone who has sent spends seven days there before returning. While Dan and Charlie talk that night, and Charlie shares how his wife was sent on the first jump and never came back, an alarm suddenly goes off. The young soldiers from 2051 scream that it's not a drill, and people rush hastily towards the portal room. Dan asks a lieutenant named Hart what's happening, 
and she responds that the last research facility in 2051 is under attack, and if they lose it, the war will be lost as well. They enter the portal room, and when the passage to the future is activated, Dan shows Charlie how to disable the security lock on his weapon. People start getting sucked into the portal, but just as Dan is about to enter, there's an error in the destination coordinates. Dan and the others end up too high in the sky, and everyone is falling to their death now. Fortunately for Dan and Charlie, as well as Dorian, they land in a pool of water on top of a skyscraper. The others, however, are not as lucky. Dan quickly gets out of the water and checks his weapon before going to the rooftop's edge to see Miami in ruins. The team now consists of only a few survivors. While the military investigates what went wrong with the time jump, Romeo Command contacts the team. Dan responds, and as they see that he is a former military, they explain to him that they are going to bomb the area because there are too many white claws around. Additionally, Dan will have to lead an operation, see or see combat rescue, to save some scientists isolated in a nearby building surrounded by white claws. He confirms the mission and immediately gathers all the able-bodied people on the rooftop. Shortly after, they are on the street, and Dan asks Nora and Cowan to run to the next block and check for any white claws. They run and confirm that the path is clear, and the team follows slowly. As they approach the building, they see many soldiers dead in action around them. Later, they arrive at the building and enter it. While trying to find their way to the room where the scientists are supposed to be, Dan is informed by Romeo Command that the White Claws can smell blood from miles away, and they must be cautious. Suddenly, they see the team of scientists, who are all dead. Romeo Command then assigns them to retrieve hard drives and biological samples from the lab. While the team is searching, they are informed by Nora and Cowan, who are on the ground watching, that the White Claws are approaching. Dan finds the jars with the samples and is notified that aircraft are being sent to bomb the area in six minutes. Dan orders Cowan and Nora to meet them on the seventh floor, from where they quickly exit through a fire escape staircase to get down and out of the building, hoping to avoid the White Claws. After entering the stairwell, they hear strange noises. Suddenly, the White Claws appear from above and start attacking them. While shooting at them, the team tries to run down and escape. Dan tries to fight one of them alone but finally gets help from Dorian, who kills it, telling Dan that they can only be killed through the neck or belly. As the aerial attack is three minutes away, Romeo Command sends vehicles to pick up the team. However, when they arrive, the White Claws completely devastate the vehicles. Several team members die in action while trying to escape, defending themselves. The aerial attack begins, and the team, now reduced to seven people, is doing their best to escape the explosions. While being pursued by the White Claws, Cowan and Nora get injured in a tunnel, where AF-22 Raptor will drop its bombs shortly. To delay the White Claws, Cowan and Nora sacrifice themselves and stay behind, shooting at the aliens while the rest of the team escapes, the remaining five narrowly manage to escape in time. A day later, Dan wakes up next to Charlie at a military base in the Caribbean. Shortly after, they meet Dorian, from whom they learn that they were the only three to survive. Dan inquires about the white claw talon that Dorian has hanging around his neck, and he responds that it's a keepsake. Dan discovers that Dorian will die of cancer in six months, something he learned when he was recruited. Dorian also tells them that the only reason he has come back multiple times is because he wants to die on his own terms. Dan is then summoned to speak with Command Romeo, whom he soon discovers as Colonel Murray Forrester, his daughter, and he is shocked. When she describes how she has a PhD in biotechnology from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, Dan is very proud. However, she explains that he wasn't brought there for a family reunion. The only reason he's there is because she made sure of it so he could help her with a critical task when the time comes, but she refuses to say what it is. They enter a military tent where Colonel Murray shows Dan that they have discovered a toxin that kills male White Claws but not females. To learn how to make a toxin that kills all of them, they will capture a female, and Dan will help them. On the way to a White Claw nest in a helicopter, Murray tells Dan about them, how one day, the White Claws simply appeared. They emerged from northern Russia and spread to the rest of the world, but no one ever found ships, drop sites, or any sign of their arrival on Earth. Dan then asks her what happened to their family between 2022 and when he died, but Maury says it's better not to talk about it. They arrive at a white claw nest, where the military has already managed to corner a female and is about to put her in a cage. 
Suddenly, she breaks free and starts attacking them. Murray descends into the nest through a hole to help the men below control the situation but fails. While Dan simultaneously sees a horde of male white claws from the helicopter heading to the nest, he also descends to help. Dan grabs one of the female's tentacles, enraging her, and tricks her into shooting sharp spines at herself. Due to this, they gain the upper hand and place the white claw in the cage, after which the helicopter takes off with the cage, while Dan and Murray exit the nest. But as they do so, more white claws arrive, and the duo has to run to a military vehicle and shoot while driving to clear a path using a heavy machine gun. Somehow, they manage to escape and reach a beach where they exit the vehicle. Murray is upset because Dan put himself in danger, as she needs him alive. But Dan tells her that he can't see his daughter being devoured. Murray begins to tell Dan what happened to their family back in 2022. Apparently, Dan left her and her mother. Dan interrupts her and says he knows he would never do that. She continues, getting sad, and explains that they separated and then divorced, and she had a lot of hope that he would fix their family and they would live together again. But then, on her 16th birthday, she received a call that he had an accident. In the hospital, she saw his last heartbeat on the monitor as they tried to revive him. Hearing this, Dan is left speechless and sad. A helicopter arrives and takes them to an ocean base, while Dan ponders what his future daughter told him. Once at the base, Dan meets Mori in her laboratory, where she is trying to synthesize a toxin. By testing thousands of combinations and with a bit of luck, they hope to find a toxin that kills the female by the morning. As they get closer to success, Dan asks Mori if she has a way to manufacture the toxin as soon as they find it. But she only responds enigmatically that she has a way. Dan has 21 hours before being sent back. He says he wants to help, to which she replies that it's a job for one person. He then says that Emmy, his mother, would be very proud of her if she saw her, just like he is now. The next day arrives, and Dan returns to the laboratory. He knows he's there for a reason and asks Mori again what his purpose is. Finally, she begins to explain. They are running out of time, and since they have no more resources, she needs Dan to take the toxin back to his time so they can mass-produce it. This way, they will prevent the war against the monsters from happening. As soon as she finishes speaking, the computer informs them that the current test has a 100% effectiveness, meaning they have finally found the toxin. Seconds later, the female White Claw awakens and emits a loud scream. Suddenly, they realize the base is being invaded by thousands of White Claws, and Dan and Murray grab weapons to run toward the helipad. On the way, the duo is cornered by several White Claws, and they have to shoot their way through. But as they continue running, Murray is hit by a spine, and Dan has to help her walk. Simultaneously, an automated voice warns them over the facility's speakers that there are three minutes left until the time jumpers are sent back. Murray falls in pain and is bleeding heavily, telling Dan that she can't walk and that he should leave her, but he refuses. She apologizes and says she's happy to have seen him like this, as when she was a child. Dan becomes desperate and sad and sees that there is less than a minute left until he is sent back. When Murray hands him the vial with the toxin, a white claw appears and tries to attack them. But the ground suddenly gives way, and the white claw and Murray start sliding toward the edge. Dan jumps and grabs her, but his hand slips, and she falls. In sheer desperation, Dan jumps after her but is instantly teleported back in the middle of his leap after Murray. He wakes up in 2022, holding the vial containing the toxin in his hand, and tells Lieutenant Hart that they must mass-produce the toxin and send it back. However, she informs him that the portal to the future is inactive, and no one can return. He sees Charlie next to him, who has also managed to return. When he gets home, he emotionally embraces his little Murray, who happily meets him. That night, Dan explains to Emmy that he found Mori in the future, and they made the toxin together. He also tells her that no one knew where the White Claws came from, they were just there in the year 2048. When his wife suggests that the creatures could have landed years before and that's why there are no records of a landing or any form of emergence of the beings, an idea forms in Dan's head. He then visits Dorian at a bar, who has also returned. He agrees to help Dan find a solution to prevent the war from happening and discover when the White Claws arrived. They take the White Claw to loan that Dorian has around his neck and go to see Charlie, who analyzes the claw and sees that it has volcanic ashes on it, but from China, not Russia. Dan can't understand how Chinese volcanic ashes end up in Russia, and Charlie asks if he knows any volcano experts, which he remembers someone. 
They end up in Dan's biology room, where the trio asks Martin how a creature from Russia can have Chinese volcanic ashes under its claws. Martin explains that it must be from the millennium eruption a thousand years ago because volcanic ash from that eruption can still be found in deep ice in northern Russia. The team realizes that the White Claws must have arrived at that time and been deeply frozen in the ice, and when they simulate how the ice melts in Russia, all the ice disappears by the year 2048. After their discovery, they request funding from the United States Air Force for a secret mission in Russia, which they will not provide. So, instead, Dan goes and asks his father James to take them there, telling him that he needs his help, to which James immediately agrees. They load up a plane, and Lieutenant Hart joins them after bringing as much newly produced toxin as she could. Once in northern Russia, at the likely location they determined for the White Claws, they drive on snowmobiles. Suddenly, they experience some sort of interference and can't use their instruments or even the compass. They detonate the ice and enter a fissure that opens up. Eventually, they come across a large object stuck in the ice. They open a hole with a metal saw, and Dan tells James and Charlie, who are outside, to shoot anything that comes out. They enter and find the central part, where they see an alien race that is not White Claw. They continue and eventually find a compartment with several White Claws in it, concluding that the White Claws are cargo. By injecting some of them with the toxin that kills them, the other White Claws start to wake up, and before they can inject them too, several of them break free and start heading for the exit. Dan informs Charlie and James to be ready, managing to stop three of them as they exit, but a fourth one escapes. The team inside the ship retrieves C4 explosives to blow up the ship if necessary. While Dorian hands the White Claw Talon to Dan, he tells Dan to save his daughter and track down the one that escaped. As Dan is running back to the snowmobiles, the others inside the ship encounter an entire colony of White Claws that are waking up and starting to attack. The entire team inside the ship sacrifices themselves, and Dorian shouts before detonating all the C4, stating that if he's going to die, he'll die his way. The ship explodes, killing all the White Claws inside it. Dan returns to James and Charlie, and James tells him that what escaped is big. Dan says it's a female, and they definitely have to stop her. He and his father then jump on two snowmobiles and start tracking her footprints in the snow. They split up, and shortly after, Dan sees the White Claw running toward his father to attack him. However, James has set a trap, so the White Claw bites a decoy, and James starts shooting at it from a distance. This time, though, the White Claw really starts going after him, but Dan manages to hit it with his snowmobile before it reaches James. They both then shoot at it, making it retreat until it falls off a cliff. They assume it's not dead, and they are right. Suddenly, the White Claw appears out of nowhere and attacks them. It shoots Dan in the leg and goes after him, and both Dan and James manage to shoot its eyes as it gets closer. Dan injects the toxin into its arm and thinks it's over. But the White Claw tears off its own arm, stopping the toxin's effect. It tries to go after Dan, but James cuts his hand to save his son, making the White Claw go after the scent of his blood. James, who doesn't want to lose his father, jumps on it and stabs it with Dorian's claw. Finally, he gets another dose of the toxin and injects it into the White Claw's mouth and kicks it off a cliff, killing it once and for all. They lie down in the snow, exhausted, and Charlie joins them. In the final scene, Dan arrives home and gives his family a big hug, then introduces Mori to his grandfather. Throughout the whole time, we hear Dan's voice saying that he will never leave this family.